battle cry will be total extermination. They are to be exterminated. Exterminate, annihilate, destroy. Daleks conquer and destroy. Exterminate them. The Daleks shall sweep away Gullifly. Do not deviate. Exterminate. In 1963, Evil of the Daleks was supposed to be the final end of the Daleks, but five years later they were back, with Terry Nation signing off on the script, which originally was meant to be the season 8 finale called Daleks in London, before becoming the season 9 opener in Day of the Daleks, written by Louis Marx. And hey, we're in colour now. Cool. Although in the early 1970s, 90% 90 of TV audiences were still watching in black and white. Anyway, we have a new Doctor with the dashing John Pertwee and his lovable companion Joe Grant played by Katie Manning. This story takes place during the period in Doctor Who when the Doctor was exiled to Earth by the Time Lords, with very few exceptions. So with a grounded Doctor working for UNIT, with Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart played by Nicholas Courtney, the Doctor and Joe are sent to investigate an assassination attempt on Sir Reginald Stiles, Britain's representative at the UN, who claims to have been attacked by a ghost. The Doctor discovers that the ghost is actually a time-travelling guerrilla fighter attempting to change an apocalyptic future, where a series of wars allegedly caused by Stiles led the planet vulnerable to conquest. The Doctor is sent forward to the 22nd century to find out what has gone wrong in humanity's future. All the while, Joe is being manipulated in this future by the Controller, an overseer of human slaves in the future, and also in command of an army of dumb, ape-like creatures called the Ogrons. Oh yeah, and uh, and the Daleks are there, I guess. Day of the Daleks started life as a script that mainly featured the Ogrons, but was forced to add the Daleks in last minute, and it really shows. The Daleks are prominent, but don't really contribute much other than moving the plot forward every so often. Everything just feels off and out of place about them, from the way they're filmed, Red pot. to their dialogue. She called him the Doctor. Doctor, did you say Doctor? And even their voices sound like they were done with complete disinterest. Whoever is operating the time machine is an enemy of the Daleks. All enemies of the Daleks must be destroyed. Exterminate them. And it's clear that the show is working on such a limited props budget because at the climax of the story, the Daleks plan to invade with only three of them. In fact, when Day of the Daleks got a DVD release, they dubbed over the dialogue with Nicholas Briggs's more refined turn as the Daleks. Whoever is operating the time machine is an enemy of the Daleks. All enemies of the Daleks must be destroyed. Exterminate them. And they even used special effects to add more Daleks in the final battle. It goes far to making them seem like a more credible threat, but it still doesn't solve the general issue that they feel like an afterthought in their own story. Especially when you consider that the Daleks already invaded Earth in the 22nd century. In fact, one Dalek even brings up that they're invading again. The Daleks are easily the weakest part of Day of the Daleks, and that is disappointing. Even the big Dalek reveals fall flat, like the cliffhanger for episode 2, when the Dalek's head just keeps bobbing around. This is the first Dalek story to feature the gunmetal grey colour scheme which will carry them through the rest of the classic series. It works in colour, especially contrasted against the gold Dalek Supreme. The only real other change with the switch to colour is the Dalek eye lens, which is now painted on. And yeah, it's a bit of a downgrade from the active contracting lens from the black and white stories, but maybe that didn't translate to colour? I don't know. Anyway, this is actually a really strong story regardless, because everything surrounding the Daleks is well executed for the most part, and pretty interesting. With the third Doctor being grounded, it means the writers need to make more of an effort to bring the threat to him, so the conceit of time-travelling assassins is a good one, and despite the fourth dimension being so vital to the DNA of Doctor Who, time travel actually isn't used as a plot point that often, but the idea of freedom fighters coming back in time to kill someone who the history books have deemed responsible for Earth's misfortunes is such a neat concept, and here is Day of the Daleks doing it over a decade before the term 
Also, this episode simultaneously dubs the guerrilla soldiers as both freedom fighters and also terrorists, as the serial does acknowledge that what they're doing can be interpreted in different ways depending on the perspective. During the time of the making of this story, the IRA were quite prominent at the time, and this dual national narrative was prominent. So the future soldiers were a really topical and effective concept. Oh no, sorry, uh, Doctor Who was never political before Chris Chibnall came along. I'm sorry, I, I guess myself and also the first-hand account of the showrunners and the writers at the time must have been mistaken and simply not understood what they were writing about in their own programme. Also really effective is John Pertwee, who just has this James Bond-esque swagger about him. He's eating fine foods, he's drinking all of the liquor in Styles' cabinet, driving random vehicles which appear out of nowhere, and there's this effortlessly badass moment. Pertwee is great here, but there's still a few awkward moments in terms to his character, like how in part 4 the Doctor seems against murder at any cost, even sparing the life of the controller. But in part 2, he just shoots and kills an Ogron who's not even an immediate threat to him. Also, this is the only story in Dalek Semba which prominently features Unit, therefore the only story to feature the Brigadier. And I just love the dynamic here. This is the opener of Season 9, so we are already two years into this new format of the show, and you can just tell that the Doctor and the Brigadier have an unspoken bond, which is made up of both genuine respect, where the Doctor can be away from the Brigadier for several episodes, and then just shows up and starts barking orders, and the Brigadier just goes with it. Brigadier! Brigadier, get everybody out of this house at once. Where the devil have you been? Never mind all that. Just clear this house immediately. What's the man talking about? Do as he says. Look, there isn't much time. Brigadier, if you can't get this lunatic out of my way... I know it all sounds incredible, sir, but the doctor usually knows what he's talking about. Tell him to fall back. Let the Daleks into the house. Doctor, are you sure it that's... may not make military sense, but it's the only way. All right. Brigadier to all units, let them pass. I say again, let them pass. But there's also some slight jabbing and mockery. Well, the thing is completely dead now. But it was working. Yes, it started to work. And... Ah, I see. Yeah. Yes, the temporal feedback circuit is overloaded. The what's done what? In your terms, Brigadier, the thing's blown a fuse. Joe Grant doesn't have much to do here, but it means the supporting cast made up of the Freedom Fighters are given time to breathe. Well, most of them anyway, because when the final twist is revealed at the end, I genuinely had no idea who they were talking about because I hadn't retained any of the fighters' names. It made for a pretty underwhelming climax emotionally. Part 4 just races along at a record pace. It just doesn't stop. It's packed to the brim with exposition, which ideally should have been explained an episode or two ago. At the beginning of the story, we meet future versions of the Doctor and Joe, and it just never gets brought up again. But apparently, there was a scene in Part 4 explaining their earlier appearance that was filmed, but it got cut for time. As well as a scene which explained how the Daleks survived in Evil of the Daleks, but that got cut as well. All of this leads to an ending that feels so abrupt. Watch this clip and keep in mind, I did not alter it. Your conference has been saved, Sir Reginald. Now it's up to you and your friends to make sure it's a success. You still have a choice. Don't worry. We all know what will happen if we fail. So do we. We've seen it happen, haven't we, Joe? Twenty seconds. That's how long that epilogue lasted. Part four is filled to bursting, and it still feels incomplete. They could have saved time and money by removing the Ogrons because they don't really do anything other than be the controller's obedient servants. But why can't brainwashed humans or converted soldiers fill that role? Also, speaking of the Ogrons, I've got to play this infamous clip, because just listen to the difference in how these two Ogrons speak. Your report? We found and destroyed the enemy. Any complications? No complications. Mwah! Mwah! Chef's kiss, I love it! What else is there to talk about? Uh, well, actual BBC reporter Alex McIntosh shows up to play himself, which is pretty fun. The Dalek deaths are pretty weak, with either strange posing or people just putting their hands in the air saying how big a fish they once caught was. 
Oh, and the scene where the Daleks determine the Doctor's identity by watching the ending credits. No joke, that actually happens. But one part which really surprised me about this story was how good Aubrey Woods was as the controller. And yes, that's the same Aubrey Woods who played the Candyman in Willy Wonka the year before this story was broadcast. But yeah, Woods is really good in this. He's clearly giving a very different performance to everyone else in the cast, but he's creepy and theatrical, yet somehow understated. For the next work period, targets are to be raised by 10%. It's impossible. I can't do it. And I shall just have to find someone who can, shan't I? And you know what that will mean, don't you? To you. And to your family. Please, I... I didn't mean it. I... I'll do it somehow. Good. We'll just regard this as a friendly warning, shall we? It's a really memorable performance, though there is the awkward scene where he's told to increase worker productivity by 10%, yet at this point in the story, we've not even established that there are workers yet, and we don't know what they're doing. There has been a drop in recent production figures. That can be explained. Explanations are irrelevant. Production targets must be maintained. We will reach the targets on the next work period. For If we push the workers any further, they will die! Only the weak will die. Inefficient workers slow down production. Blimey, this sounds like a Tory cabinet meeting. But anyway, this is a guy who is so committed to being a good servant to the Daleks that he is willing to say and do anything to prop up this false truth about the workforce he's maintaining. Do you run all your factories like that, controller? That was not a factory, Doctor. Hmm? Then what was it? A rehabilitation centre. A rehabilitation centre for hardened criminals. Including old men and women. Even children. There will always be people who need discipline, Doctor. Now, that's an old-fashioned point of view, even from my standards. I can assure you that this planet has never been more efficiently, more economically run. People have never been happier or more prosperous. God, it really does sound like a Tory meeting. At first, I thought the controller would undergo the same arc as characters like Mavic Chen or Maxtable, where he would serve the Daleks and despite his obedience, he'd be killed by them. But in part four, he takes the slightest chance at hope and he defects. It's a refreshing change of pace. You are a traitor to the Daleks. You must be exterminated. Who knows? I may have helped to exterminate you. Yeah, Day of the Daleks has a hell of a lot going for it, with a lot of interesting characters and a moral dilemma at its centre. It's honestly been the biggest surprise of this marathon so far. Oddly enough, despite its title, the Daleks themselves are without question the weakest part of the serial, and it's everything else around them that works, for the most part. But this was a fun watch, not to mention refreshing, after watching 45 episodes this past week, watching a four-part story was a much breezier experience. Ironically though, this might have been better as a six-parter, but maybe the BBC didn't want to pay Terry Nation an extra £25 per episode on royalties, which is what his deal amounted to in the 1970s, and that roughly translates to about £350 per episode in today's money. That deal for Terry Nation also meant that he was contracted to write the next story in this marathon, but until then, this story was, ironically enough, not the best day for the Daleks, despite it being a standout story in almost every other aspect. Mm -hmm.